Pa. The director and senior researcher at the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities in Skopje, Macedonia. She's also a professor of philosophy, gender studies, and sociological theory at the University American College, Skopje. During the 2008-9 academic year, Kolotsova was a visiting scholar in the Department of Rhetoric, Program of Critical Theory at the University of California, Berkeley. Her long and truly impressive list of publications includes, most recently, Toward a Radical Metaphysics of Socialism, Marx and La Ruelle, published by Punctum in 2015, The Cut of the Real, Subjectivity in Post-Structuralist Philosophy, Columbia, 2014, The Lived Revolution, Solidarity with the Body in Pain as the New Political Universal, 2010, and The Real and I, On the Limit and the South, in, 20, in 2006. Kolotsova's work pivots on four points of reference, Marx, Lacan, La Ruelle, and feminism. Or perhaps the first three as points of reference, and the fourth, feminism, as the attention to the lived reality of gendered bodies literalizing the first three. From Marx, she takes the insistence on the real, the embodied, and the living, all of which she contends are often falsely represented as materialism, as if one conceptual creation could contain all the force of these ways of being. Marx, she points out, is primarily interested in exploitation, and the history of philosophy's exploitation of the real is no exception. What, after all, does capitalism exploit? It exploits the reality of labor, of bodies, of materials, subjugating all of them to the immateriality of labor and capital. For Kolotsova, Marx points us back to the moments before the dematerialization of the world. Lacan, in his turn, creates a way of discussing this material world, the real. Lacan, Kolotsova explains, sees in the turn away from reality the alienation of the human from itself, what is commonly termed, termed subjectification. As a human experience, this is to be expected. As an intellectual experience, it forms the grounds for the deliteralization de of the world and the opening of the newly conceptualized individual as a psychically wounded kind of being. Along with his contemporary interpreters such as Zizek and Zupanich, Lacan provides a critique of the alienated subject. For Kolotsova, the singularity of the real, always present and mostly unacknowledged, continues to haunt the putative independence of the individual. Her third touchstone, Francois Laruelle, provides a theoretical grounding for this project. His processes of non-standard philosophy, to which Kolotsova repeatedly returns in her work, allow for understanding what she calls the, quote, endless multiplicity of singular actualizations of the real, close quote. Laruelle creates alternative ways of thinking against philosophy's abstractive nature. His democratic projects open up speculative avenues against the mastery of absolutism. And Kolotsova's reading of La Ruelle, to theorize means to act. Imminence and radicalism are one. Since we will hear from La Ruelle himself tomorrow, I will leave the overall influence of his thought on Kolotsova to you. But I do want to emphasize the centrality of his insights to her work. How then does feminist theory overcome these various forms of alienated thought? Feminism desubjectifies. It points to the literal and real physicality of the world and at best insists on the primacy of that reality over masculinist abstraction. Following Butler, Bredotti, Haraway, and Irigare, Kolotsova points to the necessity of reality, what Butler called bodies that matter. But rather than following these theorists and turning this into another subjectification, as those who argue that all is language and language is all, Kolotsova argues that we take the complex, interrelated material of the world as the site for non-alienation. The imminence of the real, she maintains, is where we must go, leaving all philosophical isms behind. Nature, the physical, and the sensual comprise the terms of feminism, rooted as it is in embodied life. All meaning, including abstract meaning, becomes commonly held. Life can become non-automated if we could recapture meaning, 
property, and value from capitalism and alienation. Sexuality, reproduction, and the physical are life's source. She suggests we recognize that. Please join me in welcoming Katarina Kolotsova. Thank you, Carol, for the beautiful introduction. Um, it's just it's pronounced Kolozova, oh, <laughs> as if it were written with S. So we transliterate phonetically, so as uh, trouble. But uh, I mean, I, I understand. With all of us from ex Yugoslavia, with all these Z's and G's, it's, uh, I can understand the confusion. Uh, also, thanks to Canon and uh, the Center for inviting me and Carl for organizing everything. So, I better start because it, I might not have enough time to read it all. I might have to skip parts. Uh, I hope not. We'll see. How much time do I have? Um, I think we have till five. Till, uh through questions and answers, we have through 5.15. Oh, okay, I think uh, I'm going to get by then. Uh, okay, so uh, the first section of philosophical and speculative economist and the vanishing bodies. Uh, Marxist uh, humanism is dedicated to reclaiming the human in the last instance, insofar conceptualized as physical. In Marx's original texts, uh, the physical, along with the term real, is used in the same sense in which his interpreters refer to the notion of the material. Uh, I, I propose the use of the term physical in the sense of material, the material, according to Marx's doctrine, so material as in the Mar Marxist doctrine, um, but instead of material, we will use the term physical, because this is the term used by Marx. Not most of the time, all of the time, next to real, and hardly ever material. He speaks of materialism sometimes, but never of the material in the sense materialists or materialist Marxists. Uh, Marxists speak of the material nowadays. So instead he uses most often the term physical and real, and some uh, sometimes uh, sensuous. Um, so um, I propose the, uh, the use of this term and for the following reason, uh, reasons. Uh, one, it is the choice Marx makes himself in his writings, equally in the early works as in the later ones, so no epistemological break there, uh, or anywhere, uh, if you ask me, uh, almost without an exception, referring to the physical and the real rather than the material and at places in the text that have been re referred to uh, as dealing with the argument of the material or materiality by the Marxist-Leninist uh, Lenin tradition of interpretation. Second reason, material is, as Marx himself has demonstrated, uh, inextricable uh, from the materialist philosophical conception. All right. So materialism, the concept of materialism and materialist deriving from it is a philosophical concept in its origin. So this is why he's cautious uh, with this term. Um, and I will follow him. Uh, uh, according to the same logic, of course. So Marx, uh, on the other hand, seeks to create a science of humanity uh, on the remnants of philosophy as the latter is a form of thought incompatible with a socialist society. Uh, therefore, the physical and the real are in fact more precise designations for materiality devoid of any philosophically pre-assigned signification. So materiality, insofar product of materialism, cannot escape philosophization, as the very concept does not have any history or sense outside philosophy, including the sciences in their philosophical aspects. The material reality subject to scientific study is in fact the physical reality, regardless of whether living or not. Whereas the abstract idea of materiality escapes representation in scientific languages. 
it's meaningless as such to science. Uh, so, by way of combining François Laruelle's non-philosophy and non-Marxism, his non-Marxism, with Marxist science, we are sketching the contours of a, material, a materialist post-philosophy relying on a non-philosophical concept of the material. One grounded in Marxist understanding of, uh, of it as the real or the physical and helped with uh, Laurel's uh, methodology. So it is a method uh, necessary for the thesis on the non-human we shall propose here. The non-human is the non-philosophical flexion at least the way I use it here, the non-philosophical flexion of, say, Haraway's socialist and feminist project of the post-human, the one she called the cyborg, but also more, most recently of, uh, but also most recently the inhuman. I mean, she proposed uh, the term, among others, of course. Um, although I am drawing on her propositions, so. Uh, in its foremost but determining theoretical backdrop, it relies on Marxist conception of the human in realist or as termed in the Marxist tradition materialist terms. Uh, the term itself, however, uh, non-human, originated as part of the interpretation of Laruelle's work, more specifically that of John Mollarke as formulated uh, in his uh, book from 2015 uh, titled All Thoughts Are Equal, Laruel and Non-Human Philosophy. The notion of the physical uh, we will be uh, using here is therefore taken from Marx and remains unattached to the philosophical romanticizations of the term, including those of the postmodern feminist type. Physical, in the sense used here, is descriptive, in Laurelian sense, or a clone of the effect of the real, created by a concept and a reality subject of our analysis here, according to the method proposed by uh, Laurel in his introduction to non-Marxism. The reality of the human body that is necessarily un and unavoidably extended through prothesis. Uh, pr uh, uh, prosthesis. So, uh, no, yeah, let me repeat this. So there is actually no distinction between the physical and uh, the technological, according to this concept of the post-human. Uh, uh, the technological is seen as prosthesis, is understood as prosthesis, and I claim that this is in line, uh, in line with uh, Haraway's proposition. Um, uh, uh, her proposition that we understand the technological as uh, a process uh, to animality uh, in her case. So, uh, the reality of the human body that is necessarily and unavoidably extended through processes. The self or subjectivity, on the other hand, is the non-human's alien yet inalienable inhabitant it is the automaton of language. So, whenever I uh, speak of the automaton here, I speak of the automaton of language, which can be uh, extended to, um, automa to the automaton of value production, the automaton of capitalism, that is. So, uh, and other forms. Uh, or materializations of the same automaton, which is basically that of language. So, more specifically, in the present analysis, the term physical serves as a clone of the effect of the real or of the constitutive trauma of what is subjected to capitalist exploitation and annihilation. The physical world, ranging from animal, including the human, uh, uh, in including human bodies, via natural resources to the sheer physicality of the commodity that uh, of commodities that has been stripped of any value through commodification they have been uh, so uh, these objects uh, commodities through co commodification they have been transformed into value then in surplus value which in the uh, speculative games of finance industries unavoidably uh, derealizes the physical uh, 
so materiality, is, materiality in all these senses. We can also refer uh, uh, physicality. I'm sorry. So we can also refer to the physicality of commodities, objects, buildings, machines, etc., as to materiality. Uh, materiality, and we can make that reference non-philosophical. That is in line with its function in uh, Marxist political economy. In addition to the material real, there are real abstractions. Let's add that as well, uh, as Zondreta uh, used to claim, such as money, for example, that are real insofar as they have that effect of a determining exteriority which is materialized. These materializations, as a rule, come in the form of trauma. I argue, in the psychoanalytic sense of the word. So cloning of the real would refer to, the, uh, to description without philosophy of the sensations that can be conveyed via commonsensical language, much like Sellers' manifest image of reality, which precedes its scientific reimagination. Re According to Sellers, the manifest image or the cognitive material common sense is made of provides the possibility for a scientific image of reality to emerge, albeit through a fundamental discontinuity with it. Parallels between this idea and Immanuel Kant's and François Larouel's epistemological projects can be established, as Ray Brassier has demonstrated in his book from 2007, Nihil Unbound. As we are seeking to combine Larouel's non-philosophy and the post-philosophical project of Marx, let us note that Laruel grounds his methodology of cloning the real precisely in Marx without Marxism. That is, in Marx's strip of philosophy. Laruel terms his own reading of Marx as non-Marxism. In a first and grounding gesture, non-Marxist thought is rigorously descriptive, as he would put it, attempting to clone the effects of the real only to arrive to the second movement of establishing a scientific thought operating with philosophical material that has been transcendentally impoverished. His uh, term. So, by transcendental impoverishment, we mean a Lorelian gesture of producing thought that, in its last instance, departs from philosophically unorganized material. He calls the hora, Kora or Hora in Greek, succumbing to the real rather than to the principle of philosophical sufficiency. There is one founding, uh, also a uh, real uh, there is one founding theoretical model for the non philosophical and non Marxist theory Laurel proposes, and that model is, in his own uh, words, Marxism or Marx without the subsequent philosophizations of his uh, uh, texts. Uh, Following Marx and Laurel, I will argue that it is by way of applying scientific rigor upon the empirically assembled data that one can unravel the laws that govern the realities subject to our theoretical or scientific uh, investigations. Therefore, physical here refers to a reality which is tangible and can produce tangible effects. Physicality itself vouches, it's not the same as the real, but it vouches for an effect of the real, although it's neither reducible to the real nor the same as it. As already noted, this does not mean that the universe of meaning, that is signification and language, is the determination in the last instance of its effects of the real. Also, the real abstraction is indeed real. Money, wage, market, they are abstractions, but what makes them real are the effects of materialization constituting an exteriority uh, to the automaton of signification, the automaton of signification being, being language, uh, which is always already subjectivized. As for the uh, labor force, regardless of whether employed and active or unemployed and dormant, its determination in the last instance is that of bundle of brain, muscles, and nerves. Uh, I'm quoting Marx here. 
To put it differently, the material outside the physical is nothing more than a philosophical phantasm. The physical, on the other hand, can be either organically, naturally, or synthetically that is technologically produced. So uh, this distinction and opposition between the technological and the, the physical that, uh, for example, the accelerationists insist uh, upon is, according to me and uh, my reading of Laurel and Marx, false, a false one. So. Uh, let us underscore from the onset, technology exists on the purely material plane as much as it exists on the purely speculative one, or that of lang language as and signification. It is as irrational technology as, as nature. And it can also make sense as much as any language does. Uh, its speculative capacities are, however, materially or physically enhanced. The material support is endowed with immortality compared to the vulnerable bundle of nerves and muscles called the human. So the physical ideal, body, mind, irrational, rational divide is a theological, uh, philosophical myth. Technology is no less irrational and no less physical than the body and nature, where, uh, and nature, whereas the physical and natural are no less rational. Rationalism is, let us uh, underscore, score, an old uh, enlightenment myth of, socio uh, of philosophy. Science does not care about rational or irrational. If an explanation can be produced, its rationality as such is less relevant than the fact that there is an explanation. The laws are uh, unveiled and the knowledge is applicable and experimentally provable. Rationalism as such is a fetish and results in a habitus rather than an effective change in intellectual history that is relevant for either the scientific or the technological development. The human is materially determined by that irrational hybrid of the physical and machine, resulting into no more and no less senselessness than the pure body, if such thing is possible beyond mere postulation. The rational part of it, uh, or the agency of making sense, uh, language, subjectivity, remains outside the materiality of either the body or the machine. It is the automaton of signification or language. The automaton of capital and philosophy is individually substantiated as subjectivity. And more specifically, that of the capitalist, uh, of the split capitalist self. The hybrid consisted of the physical, natural, or machinic, regardless, on the one hand, and of the subject of signification, on the other hand, is the monstrosity that ultimately escapes sense. It is the inhuman, Haraway writes about, uh, of, uh, or non-human, Laurel, Malarkey, and other interpreters of Laurel write of. So it is that inhuman inanity that is neither subject nor mere bo uh, merely body nor just a machine, the inhuman. Similarly to Donna Haraway's claim about the radical constructedness of the human as cyber, uh, Marx argues that sociali uh, sociality, which includes both economic production and the so-called social reproduction via the means of production and physicality, constitute the species being of humanity. Uh, the human is radically construed, yet in the last instance determined by the physical argue both Haraway and Marx. Uh, however, the physicality at stake does not undermine the fundament of radical constructiveness. Because the de determination in the last instance is not a ph philosophical truth to which an instance of the real can be uh, reduced. They, uh, the real and truth, as uh, always in our philosophy, remain radically different to one another. And uh, there is no truth in the real of, the ra of this radical hybrid. The physical, in both cases, 
should be viewed in its singularity of a determining occasion as Laurel would put it, which, uh, which however does not preemptively efface uh, the defining construction of the radical deer or the cyborg. Occasion which serve as a determination on an, uh, of an occurrence of the real or of an identity is a Laruelian term that can be said to be analogous to contingency in philosophy with the exception that occasion is not the opposite to essence or substance or necessity, but rather defines, merely defines the identity in the last instance, in a real sense. Thus, the occasion is contingency that acts as necessity. Let's put it this way. It's similar to Meosu a little bit. If, uh, uh, and his cor correlation. Is. I mean, th there can be an analogy there if it helps to follow. So, put in uh, Laurelian terms, the identity of radical constructedness remains tautologic uh, tautologically what it is. It is a real in its own right. And its representation insofar as identity is a singularity, irreducible to anything other than what it is. However, it has its own material reality and that reality is in the last instance determined or occasioned as physical. So, the identity in the last instance of uh, this radical hybrid is the hybrid, so that's the identity in the last instance, uh, and it is a real in its own right, but this uh, real, uh, uh, this determination in the last instance of this identity in the last instance is determined uh, by physicality. So, uh, the radical idea thus elaborated is fundamentally different from the split capitalist subjectivity <laughs> as it affirms the grounding heterogeneity without seeking to reconcile the duality in a form of a truth or a meaning. The real and what thinks it are unilaterally positioned. The real remains in the last instance meaningless, yet it, uh, its effects can be cloned, as Laurel would say, into thought, while thought and the real are not reducible to one another. Philosophy, on the other hand, seeks to reconcile the senselessness, uh, senseless real with the truth by way of transforming it into truth or hybridizing truth and the real into being. A philosophical entity determined in the last instance by thought rather than the real. Capitalism acts in an analogous way. Materiality is mere material for the creation of values whose first form is commodity. Uh, at the end of the process, to quote Marx, we are faced with the following reality and the, uh, at the end of the process of commodification. The value of commodity, uh, commodities is the very opposite, this is a quote from Marx, uh, Capital Volume 1. Uh, the value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance. Not an atom of matter enters into its composition. The worker who alienates his or her labor f uh, for wage divorces it, labor, from its coarse materiality. It is an alienation through a second and circular or philosophical gesture whereby precisely the radically heterogeneous self, so the deer I was previously talking about, uh, the rad uh, radically heterogeneous self is alienated from itself. For the second time, instead of being affirmed, the grounding heterogeneity is cancelled by substituting the senseless real it is uh, with a meaning, truth, to which it is reduced. The wage worker is alienated from the process of production and reinstituted as abstract labor or service, void of selfhood and materiality. Uh, this is a quote from... Uh, 
Marx, this is from the early works, the worker becomes ever more exclusively dependent on labor and on a, uh, and on a particular very one-sided machine-like labor at that. Just as he is thus depressed spiritually and physically to the condition of a machine and from being a man becomes an abstract activity and a belly, so he also becomes ever more dependent on every fluctuation in market price. By becoming an abstract activity and a belly, the worker becomes ever more dependent on every fluctuation of market price. The workings of abstraction as a procedure of ontology with direct political consequences produce a split self that is exposed to merciless exploita exploitation. The abstraction at issue and as problematized by Mar uh, Marx is a philosophical postulation of reality. It is uh, an ontological proposition of a kind. It's not uh, the cognitive capacity of uh, abstraction that is being problematized here. So, thus we are uh, not problematizing the relevance of the cognitive faculty called abstraction, but the modes of its ontologization that are fundamentally political. Uh, uh, Derealized abstraction, or one exempt from materiality, yet seeking to instill itself as the only relevant reality, the abstraction of thought that cancel, uh, cancels the real and acts in its stead, is the object of Marxist political, economic, philosophical, and ep epistemological critique, argues uh, Zonretel. So he invites us, Zonretel, to uh, conceive of a materiality determined, uh, materially determined abstraction. He calls real abstraction. Forms of thought and forms of society have one thing in common. They're both forms. Uh, this is a quote from Zonretel. Uh, the Marxian mode of thought is characterized by a conception of form which distinguishes it from all other schools of thinking. It derives from Hegel, but this only so as to deviate from him again. For Marx, form is time bound, uh, time bound. it originates, dies, and changes with time. So uh, this uh, process, the temporality itself already produces uh, its materialization. Uh, the cognitive capacity, uh, the cognitive capacity of abstraction, uh, belongs to the realm of thought, but its effects in the reality be, uh, belong to the realm of the real and uh, the material. Therefore, the, uh, this is still an interpretation of uh, Zondretto. Uh, I mean, my interpretation of Zondretto. Uh, I'm not paraphrasing. So the chasm between the real and thought is never breached, according to Zonretto, in his project of Marxist epistemology. And the materialist science does not care to do so. It is indifferent to a goal of that sort. Uh, so, a quote from Zonretto again, uh, the historical materialist stands in irreconcilable opposition to all traditional theoretical philosophy. For this entire tradition, it is an established fact that abstraction is the inherent activity and the exclusive privilege of thought. To speak of abstraction in any other sense is regarded as irresponsible unless, uh, of course, one uh, uses the word uh, merely metaphorically. But to acquiesce in this uh, philosophical tradition would be uh, uh, would preclude the realization of the postulate of historical materialism in the formation of the co uh, of, of the consciousness by the procedure of abstraction is exclusively a matter for the consciousness itself. Then a chasm opens up between the forms of consciousness on the one hand and its alleged determination in being on the other. The historical materialist would deny in, uh, in theory the existence of this chasm, but in practice has no solution to offer 
none at any ra rate that would breach the chasm. So it's a little bit like uh, the procedure of dualysis or unilateralization in uh, Laroya. Uh, but th this was on rental. So this is so because the reconciliation between conscious, uh, consciousness, thought, and the real that determines it would be a philosophical concern. Science seeks to describe, at least Marxist science, uh, uh, Marxist, uh, Larouel's proposition for uh, the science of the humans, um, the way they understand it, uh, it, it's not their concern, it's a, it's a philosophical concern, according to them. Science seeks to describe and explain the operations of reality without concerning itself with questions of metaphysics. Zonretel's Marxist science and Larell's non-Marxism, and for that matter non-philosophy too, have an identical treatment of the chasm at issue. Uh, the matter, non-philosophically too, have an identical treat, uh, uh, treatment of the, uh, uh, sorry, the matter, uh, the affirmation of the unilaterality of its two elements is yet another Larellian de denomination of the radical deal. Such is the deal at the heart of the non-human. The one consisted of the real of materiality made of machine and body on the one hand, and language or subjectivity on the other hand. How is post-human or inhuman, metaphorically called the cyber, is a very similar kind of a radical diet. Radical thus in all three uh, in instances of a diet. The non-human, the post-human, and the species being of humanity. It refers to the absence of reconciliation of the chasm zone rattle rights of. Yet all of them are in the last instance determined by the real of this chasm and its materiality. Um, Okay, so there is more explanation in detail of uh, this. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure there is enough time. So um, I'll skip some parts. So the, the exploitation of the non-human in capitalism in its last instance is occasioned by the exploitation of the physical insofar as resource. The materialistic stance of the capitalist subject embodied by both the worker who trades labor for wage, and the uh, and the capitalist. So there is no opposition here. In fact, uh, is marked by an anorexic treatment of the physical. Namely, the material is indeed the only thing that can make the capitalist subjectivity happy. However, immersing, uh, regardless of whether uh, a worker or a capitalist or member of the proletariat, which is a more correct term, uh, and uh, regardless of whether active or dormant, uh, unemployed, or as in the previous lecture, uh, lecture uh, to split uh, lumpen pro proletariat, regardless of uh, uh, to which of these subcategories uh, they, uh, he would or she would belong, and the capitalist. Uh, okay, so there both the same form of subjectivity, capitalist subjectivity. So, they are uh, marked by an anorexic treatment of the physical. Namely, the material is indeed the only thing that they can make, make them happen. However, immersing into the material without restraint or allowing, allowing to be devoured through pleasure uh, or pain renders the material meaningless, mere matter. The less transcendental or transported to tra uh, representation, the more vulgar the material is. In other words, the closer to the determination in the last instance, that is the real, the less philosophical or transcendentally minimal, the more repulsive to the capitalist subject. Capitalist subjectivity desires the material which has abrogated itself cancelled itself insofar as the vulgar real, and has therefore installed through its self-negation its speculatively produced image as the more perfect form of reality than the mere real. <coughs> so, um, 
the physical nature and the real according to Marx and Laurel. Okay. Let me see if I can. Okay. I will skip this part because I'm afraid we won't have enough time. So I'll move to the part on feminism. So, however, uh, okay, the, I skip the sectional and non philosophical reading of, of nature and the con concept of uh, nature. Um, still, we will continue to operate with the concept of physical in the way I presented at the beginning, so it, we're, you're not missing much. Uh, Feminism, socialism, and the question of automaton. The machine or automaton as an independent, self-enveloped, and self-sufficient universe of signification or value production is what constitutes capitalism out of joint. Value is produced out of value, sign out of sign, according to the laws of language as postulated by de Saussure. Language constitutes a self-sufficient universe. Capitalist market constitutes yet another exchange system of language. Unlike the natural languages that do not seek to cancel the diktat of the real and physicality, they submit to it in the last instance. Uh, the capitalist signifying chain perpetually engages in transforming the real into a resource for signification, that is value or sur surplus value. Um, this is a quote from Grundrisse, from Marx, uh, the development of the means of labor into machinery is not an accidental moment of capital but is rather the historical re, uh, reshaping of the traditional inherited means of labor into a form adequate to capital. The accumulation of knowledge and skill of the general productive forces of the social brain is thus absorbed into capital as opposed to labor and hence appears as an attribute of capital. End of quote. So, uh, machinic automation is capitalist creation of surplus value taking on a life of its own. It is the endless chatter of signifying production or production of value, tuku, uh, in a schizophrenic split from the material in the last instance. The material is always already indifferent to any attempts of the signifying intentionality to reproduce and perfect, uh, uh, and perfect it. The, uh, the capitalist exploitative relation to it intends to be indifferent, unilateral, while in fact remaining relational as it has to, uh, as it has to posit the physical as mere material. It has, to, it has to constantly do this philosophical work of positing the material as mere material. So, the metaphysical anxiety springing from the fact that the postulation, so capitalist metaphysical anxiety, springing from its own postulation, uh, uh, springing from the fact that a postulation is not the same as the real, is suited with a classical philosophical move. The postulate itself is accorded the status of the real. Its latest Author, authoritative mutation is that of constructivism, uh, as in post-structuralist philosophy, constructivism, which annuls the real as uh, irrelevant, as sheer noise, as uh, non-existent insofar uh, it is outside the human reach of comprehension, uh, comprehension and manipulation. Some of the most influential feminist Marxist philosophers have advocated technological progress as the main avenue of women's liberation. Shulam at Firestone uh, claimed that social subjugation of women is the result of their biological vulnerability. Donna Haraway has argued that the exploitation of the animal is the cornerstone of uh, capitalism and that the feminist socialist emancipation must, must go through the liberation of the physical. 
as, uh, uh, as in, uh, in, uh, in her case, uh, in the sense of animal. Uh, physical in the sense of animal, animality. According to Haraway, technology is the creation and property of militaristic and capitalist patriarchy, establishing a hierarchical binary with the biological or the animal, whereby the latter is subjugated to and exploited by the former. Uh, this is a paraphrase from the manifesto. So, to liberate the animal, therefore, implies to liberate the physical and hence to liberate women from their biological vulnerability. A continuity between the physical and the technological constituting what she terms the cyber. So a continuity between animal and machine. Similarly to what I proposed at the, at the beginning. Uh, through the concept of the radical idea. So, uh, a continuity between the physical and the technological, constituting what she terms the cyber, is the form of subjectivation endowed with the potential for socialist and feminist uh, liberation, according to Haraway. Uh, the first condition for the appearance of the cyber, Haraway argues, is the hybridization of the animal and technology, resulting into uh, bestiality, as she puts it, as its underpinning quality. Um, here is a quote from Harold. And many, uh, and many uh, people no longer feel the need for such a separation between uh, animal and machine. Indeed, many branches of feminist culture affirm the pleasure of connection of human and other living creatures. Movements for animal rights are not irrational denials of human uniqueness. They are a clear-sighted recognition of connection across the discredited uh, breach of nature and culture. The cyborg appears in myth precisely, uh, precisely where the boundary between human and animal is transgressed. Uh, far from signaling a walling off of people from other living beings, cyborgs signal disturbingly and pleasurably tight coupling. Bestiality has a new status in this cycle of marriage exchange between the animal and the machine. Bestiality both, uh, means both animality and monstrosity. And the cyborg is a monstrous figure preconditioned by politics firmly asserting continuity between nature and culture, body or the organic uh, in her uh, vocabulary, and technology, animal and human, uh, human argues highway. So there is another quote, I will skip that. Uh, a new politics that is profoundly feminist and socialist, a cyber politics, ought to emerge from the hybrid subjectivities made possible precisely by the affirmation of the defining continuities between animal and machine. The prerequisite of Haraway's and Firestone's projects of a feminist and socialist revolution through technology is, let us underscore, the emancipation of the body from the brutal exploitation on the one side, uh, uh, sorry, on the side of what obviously come down, comes down to Hegel's spirit. A rational idea which sees the natural or the physical as mere material to serve uh, a superior purpose. The element that is superior in the philosophical binary is, of course, thought, mind, or the idea. The defining capitalist and or philosophical dualism dictates that uh, rationality is more than a mere cognitive faculty. It is the main constituent of its own ontology insofar as rationality, uh, insofar as rationality is and for itself the purpose. If we are to pursue a, a, a feminist socialist project established in fidelity with Marx's oeuvre, we should overcome the founding uh, contradiction of capitalism consisting in the split between abstract activity and a belly. The brutal indifference of abstraction vis-a-vis -vis the belly uh, creates an unsustainable division that will inevitably be materialized or realized as revolt. Because it's unsustainable, it will result into 
the materiality of revolt. And it will be the revolt of the suffering bodies, always already preceding that of philosophical indignation. Like the note, notes in the videos we saw uh, this morning. So, regardless of the outcomes of such imagined revolt, the very logic of capitalism will not only be undermined, but also cancelled. It will consist in rendering meaningless or disabling the very possibility of, uh, of the cruelty specific to capitalism, the full rationalization of any suffering of the body producing self-exploiting subjects uh, or commodities. Sexuality and reproduction are central coordinates of bodily uh, experiences. That is why I do not see the possibility of a feminist emancipation in the capacity of technology to, uh, in the capacity of technology to amputate uh, sexuality and reproduction from uh, the female body. A properly Marxian vision of technology's feminist emancipating force would consist in arguing for its prosthetic function instead of ontological function, as some would argue. Um, instead of assigning it an ontological status, a Marxist feminist vision views technology as a social function of prosthesis Social, so not philosophical, not ontological, social function of processes to the human body and practice. So this is humanism after all, in a way. So uh, we should understand the term processes uh, in its etymological sense, referring to its status of extension with respect to the physical rather than substitute or, uh, rather than substitute or ontological perfection as in nature more perfect than nature itself. Instead of relying on the philosophical interpretations of technology, which are unavoidably determined by the hierarchical oscillation between reason and body, a Marxist understanding of technology should operate with its pre-philosophical meaning of techne, and therefore its prosthetic essence. Anchoring technology in the real and in the physical is in direct opposition to the self-sufficient universe of the automation defining of capitalism, both as metaphysics and as economy. The prosthetic function of feminist and communist technology will serve the liberation of the female body from pain, from the physical suffering specific to the female sex, and uh, increase the potentiality of its active participation in social reproduction. Uh, at this point of technological development and uh, accelerationist euphoria, Firestone's warning that technology does not possess immanent emancipatory tendencies but can rather be used against women and children seems urgent to consider. What technology does and how it does it affects the entire society and makes it subject to political debate and the field of political struggle. The idea that science and technology possess some inherent laws of uh, functioning and self-regulation that are independent from the ruling tech ideology in a society resembles the neoliberal naive belief that the capitalist economy is based on laws that constitute a nature in its own right. So the logic behind it would be capitalist by this analogy. It is for this reason that economic science of uh, authority should be able to convey and problematize its political uh, metaphysical presuppositions and economic conditions. Conceptualized in line with these parameters, technology or the proponents of infinite technological progress should be able to account for its social consequences and set its political goals. In other words, the metaphysical presupposition that technology's development or the progress moves along a curve of in innate infinity must be subjected to critique, historical materialist critique. This presupposition stems from a primary gesture of philosophical spontaneity according to which self-perfecting reason is imminently infinite. Uh, 
human mind can only attribute infinity or immortality to one of its creations rather than accurately reflect it. The idea of infinity as uh, immanent to technological devel development is as te uh, te uh, te uh, teleological as that of Christ's uh, resurrection. A socialist correction to it would, uh, would consist in conceiving the metaphysics of technology, so I'm embracing metaphysics, I would just reconsider it uh, or um, found it uh, into something completely different and non-philosophical, non-philosophical metaphysics. So uh, a socialist correction to it would consist in co uh, reconceiving the metaphysics of technology in terms of finitude, a form of thinking that can be determined by the lived and the real. Okay, so I'm still standing. <laughs> I would rather sleep. Uh, so are there any comments or questions? I'm fine with my question. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for your talk. I was just wondering if you could clarify a little bit um, your your relationship or what you're trying to pose here uh, in, in, in you know as against or or with I wasn't quite sure accelerationism. Like, what is the relationship that you're trying to um, you know, elaborate? Here? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, accelerationism is a form of ontology of uh, technology, so the fact that there is ontologization at stake there, uh, and uh, which is due to the fact that there is philosophy uh, there, or they do not reject philosophy, they operate via philosophy or uh, as philosophy, um, but the, the fact that there is uh, an ontology there is problematic to me, uh, from a materialist, Marxist, and non-philosophical point of view. So, uh, uh, as this is uh, this uh, the, uh, uh, theoretical or uh, methodological proposal as well of this sort, um, I would not operate with any philosophical concept uh, of technology. I would see it as problematic, and I try to explain in what way it is. Uh, Problematic for a uh, uh, non philosopher, um, first of all, because it is in doubt with the uh, self sufficiency, the, 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 uh, yeah, self sufficiency or sufficiency that is uh, uh, the principle of all philosophy, uh, according to uh, Laurel, which I would, will add my interpretation or, uh, or my interpretation of some of the political uh, political consequences um, I, I see there. So the principle of self-sufficiency. Actually, this is also uh, our real uh, proposition or interpretation uh, as well. Uh, although I'm not sure explicitly he'll uh, com uh, say if it's the case or not. Uh, the philosophy, so having a philosophical concept of uh, technology which implies certain perfection, uh, uh, like a self-regulating principle of auto-perfection of nature would be a teleological proposition according to me. And uh, teleology according to me, is religion or theology. So, uh, and this is why uh, this, proper, this concept of technology, this accelerationist dream about technology is in fact so non-scientific in opposition with scientific thinking and uh, uh, thinking uh, how much of a fetish they make out of science, it's striking that it is so metaphysical and in this old sense of uh, the word. So, uh, and essentially philosophical. So, there I, I see the problem. Also, it's impossible, 
uh, according to this reading and you know the last pages I read, it's impossible to have a left version of it, leftist ver uh, version of it. I don't see how it's possible. If you understand technology in this uh, way as uh, ontology of this sort, it will result into something of the uh, violent metaphysics of the Hegelian kind, uh, which is necessarily also capitalist. So that's why. So I understand that explain the physical as a counterpoint to philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not really. No, not really? No. Then I am you. <laughs> Could you, can you explain to me how philosophy functions at all in your conceptual framework? Well, uh, that's the part from the beginning where I explained uh, Laurel's uh, method. Um, let me add, okay, it's uh, first of all uh, Laurel, so he's present and this is why I feel <laughs> <laughs> explain this method. I'm more interested uh, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, I, I will. Um, I will explain. So uh, he thinks, and I'm in agreement with him, that he can define all philosophy, the entire history uh, of philosophy, uh, by identifying the following problem: uh, thought and uh, the real mirror one another. Uh, so uh, thought reproduces the real, disregards the real real that already occasioned thought, and operates with its postulate of the real. That is how the founding uh, concept of all philosophy is produced, the being, to on. Uh, in in Greek, that's, uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, also what is usually called in non-philosophy the problem of decisionism of philosophy's <coughs> decisionism. So I wouldn't call this a disregard for the history of philosophy or for historicity. This is um, okay. This is a synchronic postulate of a certain determination in the last instance, so this determination operates in each uh, uh, historical form of philosophy. Uh, it does not uh, negate history, it does not negate the, the, uh, the, the historical variations inside philosophy. Uh, it merely claims that in each uh, uh, philosophical system you can find this uh, grounding gesture as enabling of all philosophy. Uh, so that's the problem of um, uh, um, decisionism, uh, the principle of philosophy, uh, of uh, sufficiency, uh, uh, the principle of philosophical sufficiency uh, at, uh, and what he proposes as a, as a response to it would be uh, this uh, method of dualysis or unilateralization um, according to which thought uh, positions itself vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the real allows itself to be in a way imprinted by the real be descriptive of it in a way mimics scientific thinking but uh, uh, the, uh, what the non-philosophy operates with as material of study are philosophical concepts that are treated in a very similar way in which uh, science, you know, traditional science treats its object. It's a very complex, um, I did my best, maybe, maybe Francois will explain tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I just have a, a question coming out of the first half of your of mm -hmm. your description. Um, I'm curious as to the role that the object of capital has in its in a relationship to capitalism, because it seems like they would have to be co-constitutive 
but in the story you're telling, it's an abstraction that comes out of the capitalist processes. So I'm wondering what, like, can you talk more about what capitalism is as such? Well, uh, I take this from Marx. I mean, he identifies abstraction as the main problem there. Uh, he, in fact, uh, mentions this problem occasionally, but he never elaborates it uh, as a metaphysical issue. But that is a metaphysical issue in its own uh, right. Um, and it looks like he is presupposing a different kind of metaphysics, which is never elaborated clearly in his writings, but it is one that would do precisely the opposite to what uh, uh, abstraction does, does uh, in capitalism, and it seems, uh, uh, no, it doesn't seem to me, it's literally that, uh, that way, and in philosophy as well. Uh, because if you uh, remember uh, the thesis on Feuer Feuerbach, for example, or the philosophical uh, writings from 1844, and uh, also in uh, the later works as well, uh, if you remember, uh, Michel Henry uh, uncovers this uh, later uh, archives where it becomes clear that this uh, philosophical or metaphysical position in Marx has never changed. Um, so the problem of philosophy is abstraction. Yeah, the problem is something very similar to what Laurel sees as a problem there, of this sort of fabrication of the real, of not allowing, allowing, allowing thought to be determined by the real. Yeah, the uh, projects and the propositions are very analogous. So abstraction in uh, it is uh, in this sense abstraction in this sense that he problematizes uh, in philosophy as you know the founding gesture of philosophy as such um, and uh, also uh, that's the problem of commodity that's cl clear that, so, that so in capital the, the problem is uh, abstraction as well so capital founds itself in the way that philosophy found, founds itself yeah, I mean uh, he does not say that, but uh, I think that uh, you know the analogy is clear because he uh, at least here I am not you know adding anything to to what I have read in his writings. So he identifies abstraction uh, as a problem of philosophy, and he identifies abstraction as problem of capitalism that we all know, right? That's the foundation of commodification and so on and so forth. So. I'm just establishing here the fact. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm just pointing out to the fact that he really identifies this issue as an issue of, you know, both of philosophy and uh, capitalism. Uh, Joseph, you had a question? No. No? Previously. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your. Um I'm curious about your use of Schuller and Firestone. And mm -hmm. I, I, just, I guess I'm, I'm wondering why you would take her to be a representative Marxist feminist for the purpose of this talk. I mean, obviously, there's um, accelerationists have looked at her because of her interest in the in the use, advanced use of technology to um, in her analysis of uh, sex, solve. Uh, Exactly the between gender bodies, but her analysis in that book is so founded upon um, gender difference as biological difference. And I wonder if that, um, in contrast, other Marxist feminist work like Mary Rossi della Costa or um, Sylvia Federici, or even more contemporary work like uh, Cynthia Ruzas. Um, discard some of the materiality of social relations as opposed to the physicality of bodies that might be said to underlie um, um, I don't know, I actually forgot they uh, included her in that reader. 
Uh, I'm referring to her, she's necessary for my analysis because technology is prosthesis in Firestone's uh, analysis as well. So um, I'm establishing a certain uh, tradition in uh, feminist considerations of technology as prosthesis, uh, which is explicitly so in Firestone's uh, work. and. Uh, this is, uh, you know, an opposite claim actually to the one the accelerationists are making, and uh, also we find that in Haraway as well. Because she states that clearly. So it's for this uh, reason, and also because I am interested in the question of physicality as uh, as presented. Um, I don't know. I mean. Silvia Federici, I think that she sticks to the classical concept of sex rather than gender, I believe. I, don't know. I mean, we can discuss. We have, I have different readings and understandings, but this is my um, impression, at least my reading and my impression. We had a summer school together last summer, and yeah, that's how I understand it. I was interested in this idea of thinking about technology as a social function of prosthesis for the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had sort of two questions. One is, does this, first of all, does, does this imply a rejection of already existing technology and a completely different starting point? One that does not exist, one that has to come into being. Uh, secondly, when one says socially, a social function of prosthesis for the human body, uh, I am just wondering what is the conception of the body here? I mean, is this a singular body? Is this a kind of generic, universal body? Uh, because the social seems to imply uh, heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. So what would be the position of the prosthetic here? You know, if it's, if, is it something that is going to address you know, heterogeneity of the social, the non-singularity of the body? You know, to what will the prosthetic be attached? To what will it extend? Uh, well, what I presented as the radical deity or the non-human or the inhuman at the beginning as this radical constructedness uh, which had the physical on the one side uh, in the form of body and machine on the one side, so this is physicality. I, uh, I explained, I think, on several occasions that uh, as far as this construction of, uh, the, the, of the non-human as a radical idea is concerned, uh, the physicality on the one side or the instance of the real on the one side uh, is a continuity uh, between the physical and uh, uh, the machine. Actually, the, uh, the opposition between uh, uh, machine and the physical would be a false one, would be, would be one predicated on uh, philosophy. So uh, this machine in this radical idea would be the prosthesis. It serves a certain so social function. It does not have to produce a, phil a philosophical meaning that would give meaning uh, to the entire construct that is a uh, form of subjectivity call, called the non-human. So, so it is uh, the body in this sense, in the sense of this physicality as part of this uh, radical idea, this, this construct. Uh, uh, and uh, I did mention that sociality, uh, that uh, sociality, as in Marx, is this, uh, is something uh, to which we can we can establish the analogy of the cyborg. Haraway uh, argues for the concept of the cyborg. She proposes so. 
in this sense. So, of course, physicality, uh, uh, of course, hetero, uh, heterogeneity, and body not as individual body, but as this instance of physicality I have been explaining. So, whether it's singular or plural, whether it's the individual or uh, collective, it doesn't matter. I mean, it can be both. It's a category. But if I heard Kumkum's question, it wasn't about singular versus collective, but about heterogeneous. And and the prior question also, I don't know the literature very well. By the way, thank you for the talk. I, I, I didn't catch everything, but I enjoyed it very much. Um, was, maybe I misheard the question. Um, how should I put it? About the... I guess I'm wondering whether the 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 the, 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 the way you started us off with the you know jet, jettisoning the, the materialist mm -hmm. language in favor of a physical language doesn't elide some of the difficulties of the constructiveness of that physical body. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not I, I couldn't quite so first when you said that. That Federici would agree with you. I don't. I don't know. But I guess the question is m almost more fundamental than scholarly. Um, is what, what does it? Does this framework allow us to ask that question of of, of the what counts as the body? Yes, I guess in a word. <laughs> but it could be. It could be another word. Uh, I mean, this does not efface uh, gender. Uh, but gender does not uh, have to be seen as a uh, discursive construct. It can also be viewed materially. Viewed materially. Is it uh, viewed or materially? Hmm? But then you mean physically? Physically, let's put it. Well, because you, you had said you were... It does not have to be a morphology. Okay. Physicality. The real understood as physicality or body, when we assign to it a morphology, we are already sort of recreating it uh, philosophically. So uh, how should I uh, put it uh, um, uh, through an example? Um, why should one see the question of, for example, transgender as a matter of culture and identity, as opposed to materiality. Isn't there a way, isn't, uh, uh, isn't materialism a way of tackling questions? For example, this one. Uh, so it does not make it less relevant or res uh, less real. It's just a material way, uh, materialist way of looking at this. Uh, uh, issue. So uh, th there is a material, uh, materialist way of looking at the issue of uh, transgender femininity, for example. That could be, uh, you know, in line with uh, this sort of uh, feminist socialist uh, proposition. Okay. It does not deface it. Why, why no, do no, we I have to I see did, it as I, did, I didn't mean to, my question to sound combative, it was more mm -hmm. of a clarification. But this helps very much, but I guess the term materialism, as it resurfaces in your in your argument, which I think I understand now a little bit better, uh, harkens back to the tradition that you seem to want to jettison. And so, no, no, I wanted to explain uh, how I understand materialism, that I understand it uh, non-philosophically, that I do understand it in this sense of the physical, but as just explained, the physical does not necessarily has to be seen as a certain morphology, fixed uh, uh, morphology according to uh, anthropological preconceptions. So it's a category. Uh, so that's why uh, the division between individual and collective for social is not that relevant. It could be seen as a uh, as a matter of study of forms of subjectivation, which can be individual, which can be collective, uh, but these are all modes of subjectivation. Something like that, a category that can be subjectivized in uh, different ways. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. All right. Please join me in thanking Catherine Cole.